Today we have Nathan Whitaker. Nathan is the co-author of eight New York Times bestsellers. He is a Super Bowl champion. Uh, he has spoken to uh, corporations, sports teams, trade associations across the country and the world, including the Miami Dolphins, the School of Business at Duke, Leadership Symposiums, and International School of Bangkok, and has delivered numerous commencement addresses. A two-sport athlete in baseball and football at Duke University, he played for Steve Spurrier, I think some of you may have heard of him, and they won an ACC championship, which winning an ACC championship at Duke, that's impressive. Um, graduated cum laude uh, with a degree in English and political science in 1991. He also holds graduate degrees from Harvard Law School and University of Florida. He practiced law before working in the front office is of Jacksonville Jaguars and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and that's where he won his uh, football championship. In 2007, he released Quiet Strength, co-authored with Tody Dungy, which reached number one in the New York Times bestsellers list. He also collaborated with Tim Tebow and James Brown, among others. And Nathan currently lives in Gainesville, Florida with his wife, Amy, their dog, Ricky Bobby, <laughs> <laughs> two cats, Fisic, 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 and Scout, and, uh, two, and his two daughters, Hannah, a graduate from the University of North Carolina, Tar Heels, and Ellie, a sophomore at the University of Florida. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Nathan Whitaker. Thank you, Ron. Well, thank you. It is great to be here. Uh, I, I, a lot of pressure uh, awake and entertained, um, so I'm, uh, that sets the bar pretty high. Thank you. It's great to be here. Alan, thanks so much for, for making this all possible. I've known Alan for a number of years. It looks like the Gainesville Mafia may be at this table here. Um, by the way, I'll get to this in a minute when I talk about uh, some leadership personalities, but one of the things I would encourage that I'm sure you guys are a lot better than I am. When I was practicing law, I did the continuing legal education to, you know, I, I was terrible at at practicing law, and so I was probably always on the verge of committing a malpractice, and so they really wanted me to do a lot of the continuing legal education. And one of the one of the seminars I went to, the attorney said, "Look, you're going to forget everything I say, but make sure you meet the person in front of you, the person to the side of you on both sides, and the person behind you." And uh, sure, you, you're you're welcome to um, to change that. Thank you, Brandon. Um, to make sure you at least walk out with some connections of people you don't know. So anyway, uh, apparently at some point you guys might need to meet somebody who's not at your table. Um, but that was one of the most valuable things I, I learned. And so you can see clearly I didn't retain any of the legal stuff. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, a variety of, of just some leadership skills and some things I've learned because I think that, that leadership is a quality that, um, that we all can get better at, that we all can improve on. And so, and so I'll just chat with that for a bit. Um, are you, am I doing something to make it pop? Are you guys hearing that? Or is it just in my ears? It may be in my head. There's a lot going on in my head um, on any given day. You good? Down a tiny bit? Okay. All right. Can you guys hear me still? Oh, okay. Well, that's better. All right. Thank you. And then one quick question. Tom, were you going to come to this anyway? Or did you just happen to run into me in the hall and now you feel like you have to be here? Okay. <laughs> I have that happen at book signings. You ever do that? Like, I'll go into, I just want to see, like, what it's like, right? Because sometimes book signings are packed, and sometimes they're, as one of my friends with the band Sister Hazel in Gainesville calls it, humilla gigs, right? You go in and you learn humility all over again when nobody shows up. So I'll sneak into a book signing, and then you catch the author's eye, and you're like, oh, that, that eye catch just cost me $27. Um, <laughs> because, of course, they're never at Amazon prices when you go into the book signing. So anyway, I didn't know if that was the case where Tom and I walked in together, and Tom was like, well, I guess my next hour is accounted for because I got to walk in here. So anyway, good to have you, whether you're going to be here or not. All right, so let's get rolling. Um, and let's see, gosh, these, thank you for getting me all set up with this. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, five basic things of leadership, five basic components. They're simple, um, which is helpful for me. And it's just, I think, good to just run through some of these things, because I think sometimes we assume that we know leadership, that we understand leaders. A lot of times we think that leaders are uh, born. And there are some folks who are just great, great inherent leaders. I spoke um, a couple of months ago at the uh, U.S. Army Fort Eustis. They flew me up to Virginia and it's the, their trade doc training and doctrine command. And I was about to go on the air, and I was going on the air with a three-star general, and, and they were broadcasting it to all the bases. 
<clears throat> and I had this moment of what in the world am I doing speaking to the U.S. Army on leadership and, and had this moment of, of self-doubt, which we'll get to later because that's one of my points. And hopefully you guys are in a better spot than I am with that. But I had this moment of what in the world am I doing? And right before we went on the air, I don't know if he could sense it or not, but the three star leaned in and grabbed me. And he said, I am so glad you're here. He said, because the old models that we've used of fear and intimidation and charisma and the like don't work. That leadership is at its heart influence. And are we influencing others for a common good, or are we just making them do what we want them to do? And so we're trying to get out of that model. And so it's great to have you here. You can share some sports stories, whatever. And it's so it was a great uh, affirming moment, but it also was important to underline that at the end of the day, this is all about influence, right? It's not about position and leadership and forcing people to do things, but it's about how are we influencing folks? And so I think sometimes we want to be somebody else, right? In the sports world, one of the great leaders of all time is, is Nick Saban, right? And so I'll see coaches in the industry and they want to, they get promoted and all of a sudden they think, you know what? I need to, that works. And I need to do that because that works. Well, they're not at all wired to do that. On the flip side, you've got Tony Dungy, right? Who I've worked closely with, written a number of books with, worked for in Tampa Bay. As Ron mentioned, I was there for Tony's last year. Tony tells everybody we worked together for two years. And I just have to remind him it was one really, really, really long year that we were together. And so we, I was there in Tampa and, and got to see Tony. But a lot of people aren't wired to be Tony, right? You can't tell if Tony, if they're winning, if they're losing, if whatever, um, because that's just how Tony is, but we're not necessarily wired to be like that. And so I think it's important to stay true to who we are. Any, anybody, um, probably my era, anybody remember the old Steve Martin stand-up stuff where he would play to packed stadiums before he started doing movies and other stuff. But, but Steve Martin had a great line in that. He was like, Hey, how many of you have a cat? And he'd go, you know, packed room and he'd go, okay, 10. And, and he'd say, okay, but, but do you trust him? And I, I never really, I laughed as a kid and then I laughed growing up, um, but it really kind of makes a lot more sense now. I didn't have cats for 50 years. It was very much anti-cat, not sure why cats were around. Uh, dogs, we had dogs. And <clears throat> when we adopted our dog, uh, Ricky Bobby, his name was Ricky in the, uh, in the Humane Society. And our girls were young at the time and they were like, oh, his name's Ricky. And I'm like, his name's not Ricky. Somebody named him that like four minutes ago and they had to write something on the card. He's not going to answer to it. He doesn't know. We're not naming him Ricky. And my wife said, well, what about Ricky Bobby? I said, well, now you're onto something. And so she actually taught him to go outside by saying shake and bake. And so now if you say shake and bake, he goes outside and he does his business. So anyway, so that's, so that's Ricky Bobby in a nutshell. But then we were all dog all the way. Growing up and then during COVID, um, you know, COVID impacted a lot of people. And, and I don't know, I still don't know if it was negative or positive that my older daughter brought home a cat from, from her time at UF. She was in a house and just came back home across town. And, and there was a, one of the other roommates had a cat, couldn't take it home. They've got 11 kids and all, everybody was coming home during COVID. And he's like, hey, we can no longer have this cat. So she walks in, the cat's pretty cool. So the next thing you know, she takes him back to the COVID ends, lockdown ends, and, and, and then she sends us this series of photos over here to my wife and I. And, and uh, by the time we went to take a look at him, um, Rooney, it was his name at the time, and I at least got my way of saying he doesn't know his name's Rooney. Um, his leg had been, had been amputated, and we don't know, and he's always got a variety of ever-changing stories as to how he lost his leg. Uh, but that's, that's him now, and we named him Fezzik after the uh, Princess Bride character, for those of you who watched The Princess Bride. But he's Andre the Giant, and Fezzik has never, has never met an obstacle he can't overcome. But when we first got him, my wife and I were totally into the, we were totally going to like ADA proof our house, right? We were totally doing the, we asked the folks at PetSmart, we're like, all right, how, how little of a litter box, you know, how low a lip do we need? And, and we, we've never had a cat. So what do we do with, you know, he's clearly gonna, he's gonna need to overcome some stuff. And, and, and of course we've got him for five minutes and he climbs over the, the baby gate that we put to keep the dogs out of his food. And, and he puts one leg in and then another leg in and he lands on his head and he's with the whole family. And, and I realized he's a great example of, of being um, this concept of overcoming. And there are things where people really do have a lot to overcome. And so I don't want to sell that part short because there are people who really have things that they need to overcome. But for a lot of us, 
I realized that I'm more like Fezzik, or should be like Fezzik, where I spend so much of my time thinking about the fourth leg, and I spend so much time thinking, boy, if I was only better looking, if I was only wittier, if I was only quicker on my feet, if I was only better educated, if I, if only, if only, if only, whatever it may be, and I think about the missing leg when Fezzik races around. We now have another cat, that Scout, that we found in the wood pile outside our house and, and nursed with a eyedropper and and all of a sudden we've turned into cat people it's awful and my phone my phone's got all these cat pictures it's it's I'm, it's embarrassing but there it is um but Fezzik totally chases scout around totally chases my daughter's cat around whatever he has no idea he's missing a leg and I think sometimes when we think about leadership and skills and we're like well if only I was Nick Saban if only I was that boss I used to have who was so great with people if only I was whatever it may be and one of the things I've become more and more convinced about the longer I the longer I live, and, and I'm going to tie this into our superhero theme a bit. Um, I've seen enough of the, the superhero movies to make me just dangerous enough. Um, so we'll see how I do. But this idea of how we're wired with respect to introversion and extroversion. And I swear, and maybe this shows that I'm somewhere, I don't know where I am on the spectrum, but I, I feel like every time I take one of these tests, I come out differently based on my mood at the time. But they, they swear that's not true and, and whatever. But I do think I'm on, I'm on this side of the of this scale, right? So if somebody doesn't tell me at a conference, hey, you need to introduce yourself to the person to the right, to the person to the left, I will do whatever is possible to like make sure I don't actually have to speak to human beings. And, and, and people think that's strange for a person to be a speaker, right, and to do that. But I will go back to, like, my room, and I'll go sit in the closet when this is over in the dark and, and have a moment to read. Because I just don't get re-energized from crowds and all the activity and all that. I can do it. Uh, but it's hard for me. It's draining. And I think that's okay, that when we think about some of the skills that introverts have versus extroverts, sometimes we look at extroverts and go, well, they're the life of the party. They're charismatic. They're outspoken. They can clearly cast a vision, right? They can be, they can be great with engaging with folks. And, and energizing people and getting people to follow. And those are all true. But when you think about some of the skills introverts have, right, they can analyze things. They can take a number of points of view. They're slow to speak. They're going to synthesize things before they weigh in. There may be some things they do really well as leaders as well. And so I think we have to think about where, where we are. And I didn't even know the term ambivert until I started doing research on this. Very few at that point, but most of us are somewhere on the scale, <clears throat> and there are very few, they say, that are all the way at one end or the other, that, that, that it would be really hard to function if we were all the way on either. So most of us are somewhere on this, and I think it's important for us to realize wherever we are, there are probably things we can borrow from the other side, right? There may be times as an introvert that I need to have an open door policy, right? That I need to have the ability to speak to people. I've been doing some, some coaching with a, a CEO, and, and, and he is here. And he's like, look, you know, I go to work to do a job and I've got a task and I stay on it. So if I stop to speak to the receptionist, I'm pulling her off her task. I said, OK, but you know her name, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I think it's probably affirming if you walk by and greet her by name and she knows the owner of the company knows her name. And he said, you sure that won't be distracting? I said, I promise you that won't be distracting to greet her when you go into the office. And like, so I think a lot of us can learn, okay, maybe there are things I need to do to get out of my shell a little bit. Similarly, on the extroverted side, there may be times when you need to stop and not be the first one to speak, when you need to stop and decide, okay, I can take in some other points of view. Coach Gruden in Tampa, I worked two years for John Gruden, for those of you who are football fans, I'll try not to make too many football stories, but uh, one year with Tony Dungy in Tampa, two years with John Gruden. And we ended up with a staff by the time I left that were, we'd, you'd watch a staff meeting and, and, and they'd go around and they'd say, my gosh, coach, that's a great idea. And they'd go one right after another. And you're like, why is anybody else in the room if we're just going to do what John thought of in the first place anyway? And, and a lot of times it was a really good idea. But after a while, you're like, why is anybody else even in the room if we're just going to do what he wants because he's so outgoing, he's such a strong personality, everybody else, whatever, didn't want to say that. Uh, one of the other things I think that we need to be careful about when we think about introversion, extroversion, because this might apply to you, it also might apply to people on your staff, people in your orbit where they may be self-limiting, right? They may think, well, I can't be a leader, I'm not going to be a leader because whatever it may be. Um, is that better? I'm going to keep messing with that a little bit. Um, and they may decide that there are things that I can or can't do, right? That I'm, I'm just not cut out for leadership. I'm not cut out to whatever. But the reality is that they can, and we need to, um, we need to appreciate that. And I appreciate your shirt because here's my, here's my story from this. And it's going to sound silly. When I, was, um, when I was in high school, I still remember the moment. I was in an English class, and I was wearing a yellow shirt. 
And one of my classmates, she came up to me and, and um, she said, uh, I don't know, I think she thought she was being helpful, but she said, you know, it's, it's interesting how some people just have a color and yellow apparently is not your color. And I was like, <laughs> wow. And, and I already was struggling with um, ever getting any dates and the like, and so this was not helpful. And so then I'm I, literally, I mean, the, fast forward, I'm married probably 10 years. I've got a wife, two young daughters. And one day, one of them, we were out shopping or something, and one of them held up a shirt and said, this, I think this might look good on you. And I said, well, I can't wear yellow. <laughs> and they went, well, that's nuts. What are you talking about? And I said, well, you know, it's obvious. And, and, and the reality is, though, I owned that label, right? I took the label of having three legs. I took the label of yellow and look good. I'm an introvert. I'm whatever. And I owned it and ran with it. And so I've had to learn to put things, one, I now wear lots of yellow. I should be wearing yellow to give this talk. Um, but I wear lots of yellow because it's fun and it's bright and it's sunny. And apparently I don't look as washed out as I thought I did. And I can pull it off. And whatever it is that, that makes it my color, not my color, or whatever it means. Um, but the reality is that I didn't have to own that for 15 years where I thought that's who I am. And I'm, a, I'm an introvert and I'd rather not be in crowds. Well, that doesn't mean... I can't lead. That doesn't mean people around you can't lead. It may mean that there are times when I need to build in those systems, right? That I'm going to force myself to get out. Uh, my wife and I have done something called the rock boat for the last few years. It's a sister Hazel themed cruise and it's 30 musical groups and they take over a Norwegian ship. And, and so it's like every, everything, the, the main atrium, the, the theater, the pool deck is covered and it's the main stage. And anyway, it's this music festival. And so I decided after my first year that I really wanted to do a better job of meeting people. And so my wife took, my wife and I took Tootsie Pops. And so we're, we actually liked them anyway. And so we were running around with, and I just started handing them out and I started meeting people, but I realized that was going to be like my crutch to meet people that I wanted to meet people. I'm not inclined to meet people. I'm inclined to just walk by and go, Hey, and keep going. And so I, I've learned wh whatever the situation is, maybe I need to put some systems in place, um, in order to go through life. <clears throat> Here's a, um, quick example. Good friend of ours, <clears throat> excuse me, Brian Shelton, uh, used to be the head coach at the university of Florida. I think a great leader, and, and I think part of that, the proof is that he's the only coach in Division I history to win a national championship coaching both the women and men in tennis. He was the national champion at Georgia Tech for the women and then came to Florida and won a national championship at Florida. It didn't hurt that his son, Ben, who is now ranked 16th in the world, was on his UF team. But Brian's a great leader, kind of cutting the mold of Tony Dungy where he'll be walking in between courts and you don't know if they're winning on every court or losing on every court. And it's hard to tell. Brian's very introverted. And I inter in, um, and you can see they've won the national championship just moments earlier, right? And he's grinning. Everybody else is, you know, so excited. And Brian's, Brian's at least smiling. Um, Brian's very introverted. And so I'm going to, I'm going to skip over the, um, I've got a quick video here where I, where I talk to Brian. I don't know if it's going to try to play, but we're going to skip it. Um, but Brian um, um, did an interview with me where he was talking about Ben and talking about Ben is totally opposite, right? Ben wants to be the showman. Ben wants everybody to look at him. Ben actually has hit 150 miles an hour on a serve. The next closest at Wimbledon was like 135. So Ben is just this incredible talent um, and is very gregarious. And Brian said he's had to, he's now, he's resigned from UF and he's now Ben's full-time coach. And so they're traveling the world together. And, and Brian said that they were in Tokyo and Ben won a tournament without actually doing the things that came naturally to him, that he was trying to be more like Brian. And when Brian was on the tour, Brian was very, what's the next point? Let me say it. And Ben will literally, after a point, if it takes him off the side of the court, Ben will run along this end and give high fives to everybody on the, and, and it's just totally contrary to Brian, but that's Ben. And Brian said he's had to tell him, don't become me, right? I had some success, but I'm not you. You've got to be you. Stay true to who you are. You're extroverted. You're wired that way. Great. Be that. I'm wired this way. That's great. I need to be who I am. Maybe I can learn from you. Maybe you can learn from me, but don't be somebody else. Second point, obvious point, but I think at times we think of, hey, if somebody's great at their job, we certainly ran into this all the time in football. If somebody's great at their job, if somebody really is, is a fantastic leader, if there's a fantastic teammate, whatever, I'll allow them to cut corners or I can cut corners or whatever it may be. The reality is those things often come back to bite you. One of the things we had in, um, in Tampa was that Tony had a system. So we had the, um, 
I made up a mock uh, draft magnet, right? So in Tampa, we had magnets up on, on our board and they've now gone high tech and the like, but we had these little magnets, lots of cutting and pasting and doing this. And so nobody would ever wanted to draft me, right? I kicked off twice in four years. So I was never on anybody's board. Um, in fact, I just Ron blew it. I usually just tell people I played ball at Duke and let them guess the sport, right? Being kind of tall. And then they, they, they may assume it's the wrong sport, but yes, I did play um, football and baseball. And so was not very good at either and have really parlayed those into a lot of mileage for not playing a whole lot. But this is what my magnet might have looked like, right? And so one of the things that happened my uh, junior year, so I, I was the backup my first two years. My roommate was the starting kicker. He was all ACC. I could see he was one year ahead of me, so I was never going to play until maybe I was a senior. That was the hope. And, and we had five kickers one year. We had three kickers another year, and I was always able to win the backup job. So I would travel some, but I could never quite get into the games. And so, so I was just always felt like that close. So my, going into my junior year, my roommate has back surgery, so he's going to miss his senior season. And so I think, well, here we go. And Coach Spurrier goes out and signs a kid from Jacksonville Bulls. And so I've been bitter about Jacksonville Bulls ever since. Um, and Coach Spurrier decides that he's the starter, right? And so I'm, I'm convinced to this day I kicked him in training camp. And really, I was charting. I don't think anybody else was. But I was you know, convinced I was the better kicker. But he went into the first game as the starter. And he missed an extra point. He'd been struggling a little bit. Um, in practices and sure enough he missed an extra point in the first game and and had been doing some of the same and and so going into the second game we're, we're playing northwestern at home coach spur comes up to me in the middle of the week or calls me into his office and he says uh he says nate and when i first arrived on campus first practice he says uh Nate, does anybody call you Nate? And I said, no, sir, nobody does. They call me Nathan. He said, great, you're Nate. So, so I was Nate for the next three years, uh, for the next four. So if anybody calls me Nate, I know they're from that era of my life. Um, so anyway, he says, Nate, Randy's struggling. If you miss an extra, another extra point, you're the guy. So I want you to be ready, be focused all week, and be ready to go in. Great. <clears throat> so, of course, me being a good teammate, what do you think I do for the next four days? Not only, am I not, not only am I getting ready, but I'm also spending all this time with him going, well, what, what do you think the problem is? Do you think it's all in your head? Do you think it's a mechanical? Huh, because the holds look great and the snaps look great and it's not like the goalposts are moving. I wonder what your issue is. It's so short. So uh, anyway, I'm that guy, right? And so we score first, and so we're, we're pretty good at the time. We score, we go up 6 nothing, and nobody's paying attention to the extra point and everybody's trotting out except for me, right? I've got my voodoo doll out on the sideline. And um, by the way, you've heard the, the story of the, of the wife who calls out to the, to the husband from another room. And she's like, hey, do you ever have that feeling? You ever have that sensation like somebody's got a voodoo doll and they're poking it and all of a sudden you just have this stabbing pain? And the husband calls back, no. And the husband calls back, how about now? So anyway, um, so I'm trying to get Randy. I'm doing everything I can, right? And sure enough, he misses, right? And so here I go, right? So everybody is distressed, right? And I'm the one guy who's happy that our team is now only up six to nothing. And Coach Spurrier runs over to me and he says, Nate, that's it. He's only got one more chance and you're going in. And he didn't miss for the rest of the year. So it was a great experience. And one of those things where I get to tell my children, like what a horrible teammate I was and how hopefully it didn't take me all that long to learn and to realize that there are ways in which I actually should have been actually helping instead of being that guy. But it's that it's that sense of of um, there may have been some character issues. And so one of the things we came up with in Tampa along those lines was D and DC. And Tony kind of came up with this idea. They were talking about it in draft meetings and, and he really liked this idea. And then he went to the owners. They, they all agreed on the football side. And he went to the owner and he said, we're going to have a category D and DC, which is do not draft character. And if somebody had a significant character issue in college, they were just going to take them off the board. And the owner said, that's a great idea. So me and my voodoo doll, we'd have been, I'd have been off uh, if I had had any talent. So do not draft because of character. And so the owner said, great idea. <clears throat> so as Tony tells the story then, um, the owner walks into the draft room. This is a couple years before I got there. The owner walks into the, to the draft room before um, Tony's first draft there. And, and he sees they've got all the magnets up with all the first rounders and on all however many draft rounds they think it's going to go, plus some. And then off to the side, they've got four or five names of some really, really talented guys. And the owner says, well, wait a minute, these guys? And Tony said, yeah, we're, we don't want any part of them. And Tony said, well, we're going to 
we're going to play against them. I mean, we're going to, if we don't draft them, we're going to face them. And Tony said, right, I'd rather have, I'd rather face them once and have to deal with it that day than have to deal with them 364 days in my locker room. And so that was a hard thing to stand by his guns, but they did it ever since. Do not draft because of character, because of the issues of, you know, who are we going to be? Who are we going to be as a unit? And eventually those kind of things, if I can't trust you, if I can't trust you to be in the right place at the right time during the year, can I trust you to be in the right place at the right time when it's fourth and one or whatever it may be? And so character matters. Third point, all's well that ends well, right? Being an English major and not knowing what to do with my degree. I'm now a speaker, but at least I can throw Shakespeare. Uh, I believe this was Hamlet, but, uh, but I'm not sure. Um, but it's been a while. So anyway, this idea of the importance of process and, and how we do what we do. Um, and and that, that at times, I think, and, and I feel like at times these days, we are quick to let the ends justify the means. We may have always been, but it feels like whether it's politics, whether it's as long as they you know, get whatever done, I'm willing to overlook whatever it may be, or in life, or in sports, or whatever. I'll overlook stuff, and, and as long as we get it done. Well, the reality is, I think... That the journey is what matters, right? That it's, it's where we're going. And so here's a hard quote. Chuck Noll won four Super Bowls with the Steelers, so he clearly knew what he was doing. And I find this to be a really hard quote. And, and his quote is that I'd rather play well and lose than play poorly and win. And I know from my experience, if I ever miss hit a kick and it was wobbling and I still wanted it to go through, right? I never had this sense of, well, thank goodness that didn't go through because that wasn't well done. Um, but his whole point was, if we, if we do the things we know that we need to do over and over and over, the results will eventually take care of themselves. And it was borne out by, by a number of Super Bowls with some really talented players, but they also did things over and over the right way. And so Tony loves this quote, and it's a really good quote. And I think that at times, at, over time, it's borne out that if we do things the right way, that, that this, um, things take care of themselves. Similar quote from Daniel Kahneman, who is a behavioral economics guy. And he talked about, he talked, now this was in the, from the standpoint of uh, financial decisions and that people will do things irrationally, right? And that, that we sit there and we go, okay, you should do X and Y and Z, and here's the way to achieve compound interest and whatever. And, and so he was talking about it in this context, but I think that it's true in life. When you, when you look at behavioral economics or behavioral anything, that at times we have to stop and realize that life is lived right now in the moment, right? That I, I, it's important to look long-term. It's important to set goals. It's important as a leader to keep casting a vision. We also have to realize that where we are with the people we, we are with at this moment is all we've got. I had a friend who left Tampa and he went to uh, become the GM of the Bears. He made me an offer to become the assistant GM of the Bears. And I thought, well, this is going to be really cool that I've worked my way up quickly. And they were trying to give me more scouting stuff to do. And they would, I think, shred my scouting reports because they probably weren't very good. I never seemed to see him on draft day, anybody relying on them. Um, but he was going to make me his assistant GM. And I thought, well, this is great. And the Bucks blocked me because they had big plans for me. And then the following year, they fired me. So I'm not entirely clear what that was. Um, but, but what he was trying to do that I thought was, was pretty cool was he was like, look, I, you know, I'm going to be fired, right? I know I'm going to be fired. I know how the NFL works that we're hopefully we'll have some good years and we'll do some good things, but eventually it's going to run out. And eventually, you know, we'll, we'll try to sustain it over time, but why not surround myself with people I want to go to work with every day and, and let's ride it out and see what we can do and see if we can have some fun and achieve some things along the way, because the journey, matters. And I think that's, that's really true. Um, just a quick point on, on this, uh, book that Tony and I did together, um, called soul of a team. Um, as long as you buy it, I don't care if you read it. Um, no, just kidding. Um, but, but a book that Tony and I did together and, and we made it, we made it simple. Um, and, and had these four things. But, but one of the things that I think is important to think about when you talk about, um, you know, and all of the, I probably didn't do any of those things right in my voodoo story of the kicking. Um, I did none of those things right, which is why I'm qualified to write a book about it. Um, but those four elements are, are part of strong teams. And I'm actually going to have a, a, a QR code that, for a free download where you can just have a little sheet on those later. Um, it's just a warning. But, but it's important, I think, that we, that we think of things and we try to build strong relationships and try to build strong teams. And that, that uh, photo, of, photo earlier of um, 
Samwise Gamgee and carrying Frodo, right, from Lord of the Rings. For those of you who followed that, I thought I'd throw them in as the as a kind of a superhero type thing. But what a great example, right, of relationships that he was, you know, over and over. He kept saying, I'm not leaving you behind, right? I'm not leaving you. I don't know how we're going to make it. We're never going to get there. But I'm not quitting because you're important to me. And so it was about the relationships and it was about the journey and how we do things. And I think that's true. A study came out a number of years ago. A professor did a study on um, challenging people in the workplace. Uh, he wrote a book called something like the no, the no Jerks Rule or something, but the word wasn't jerks. Um, but anyway, it was like jerks in the workplace and, and how you deal with those. And so they did a study, and the study was, he, he, he put on the study, and the study was that if you wanted to make $10 or whatever it was to come and take a standardized test, show up Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, go to this building, take a standardized general, general knowledge test, and you'll make $10. The study actually was how you deal with adversity along the way. So you, the students would show up at 10 o'clock, and the sign would say, go to room 213. And so you go to room 213, you open room 213, and it's a room about this size, right? A tiny little room with a desk, and behind it is the professor running the study. And the student kind of walks in and says, like, I'm here for the test. And the professor says, how can there be a test? I've got office hours, I'm a busy person, I'm doing research, I'm writing, I've got students coming in, and now you're barging into my, there's no test here, how could there possibly be a test here? What are you doing in my office? And the students are kind of slinking out, and as they leave, the professor says, I do think there's a test in room 223, I heard something about that. So they go down to 223 to take the test. The other half of the students show up on a different day where there's a sign saying go to room 223, so they never have the interaction. And so they find that students who didn't have the negative interaction um, answered 25% more questions correctly than those who did. There was general standardized tests, but that it actually impacted their ability to think and to function when they had that negative interaction with somebody right before they did it. The other part of the test was when they walked out, somebody signaled it from inside the room. They would signal and say, okay, a student's coming out. And so when the student would walk out having completed the test, they would run into another student in the hallway who would then drop all their books at their feet. And the students who had the negative interaction were 90%, 90% less likely to help. So it made people less capable and less charitable to have those jerks around them just moments before they were going to do something. So it's important. Relationships matter. The journey matters. Who you're with matters that sometimes we think, man, this person's a star. I'll put up with whatever in the workplace because this person's so good. But the reality is that a lot of times we're actually not better off for it. And so we need to ask ourselves, are we that person? Or at least maybe I do. Another thought on that, just uh, quickly, um, this idea. So you can tell that I'm not a, I was never a STEM guy or science or whatever. Um, so the boat, I, I've been told the boat actually won't function like this. There's only two oars and seven people and whatever, but I get it. But if this is our boat, right, that we're, that our organization is headed toward our purpose, right? Hopefully this is our purpose. The question is, and this is a time when you can contribute if you'd like, um, who's the biggest issue? Anybody have any thoughts on which rower of the seven rowers assuming they all had oars and access to this side of the boat to actually row it. Who would be the biggest issue here? And there's no wrong answers. I mean, unless Alan answers, in which case it's probably wrong. By Well, okay, let's say we want to head toward our purpose. Thank you. Thank you for being that guy. Right, okay. Anybody other than Alan want to participate now? Um, who, which, anybody, any quick thoughts? Six, right, six, a huge problem. Six, huge problem, right? Five, five's an issue. I did this once with high school students. They said seven. I said, okay, I'm not seeing seven. Help me on seven. And they said, well, seven is going the right way. Seven clearly knows the purpose, but seven's not helping because they're letting five. They've got a clear view of five and, and they're allowing five to, and I said, wow, that's, that's pretty heavy, thanks. So I like seven now too. Um, all those are right. One of the things I think we have to worry about that we don't think about sometimes is two, right? Because two is a person who's there, everything looks fine, and something just slightly off, right? They, they want, maybe they want a little more playing time for themselves, and they look like a team follower or whatever. But there are times in which, and, and so the, the nice thing also about five and six is I turned into five or six, um, by the end of my time with the Bucks, Coach Gruden had been there. Um, they said community service didn't matter. Let's not go out and deal with the community. Let's not do whatever. And I thought, well, what are we doing here? I mean, all we're doing is winning football games and, 
how are we contributing to whatever? And so I was kind of becoming that guy. And, and so they fired me and I thought, thank goodness. Uh, because the nice thing about five and six is over time, it just doesn't work, right? There, there's, there's such a disconnect that either they're going to leave or they're going to make it clear that I don't want to be here, right? This is not the right spot for me. And the fact that I got fired by Tampa doesn't necessarily mean I'm, I'm less of a person. It might. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. I don't think it does. But it means I'm in the wrong spot. Right? I just needed something else. This wasn't the right spot for me. And so five and six usually takes care of themselves. Two at times can real, really be an issue because um, as I learned from my daughter who actually rode crew in, in boats that, that worked, and one of the things I did, it was called a stakeholder, and it was really cool, and there was this amazing facility down in Sarasota. Um, and now I think they've got one over at Coco, Titusville, or something as well. But it's this really clear, straight shot. And so you can see it as, as fans and as parents and whatever. You can see them rowing down the down the. Um, Nathan Benderson Park and whatever. And so anyway, as a stakeholder, I'm, I'm literally laying on the dock holding the boat. And these boats are 50 some odd feet long. And and I've got somebody in my ear saying, OK, pull it back three inches. And so did, which is really bizarre in the water with no reference point of like what's eight inches and three inches and whatever. But anyway, I'm pulling it back and whatever. And and then you'd see him take off. And so there's this eight rowers and, and you could see if somebody was out of alignment at all. And all of a sudden the boat's doing this. And, and over time you're like, holy cow, they're going to leave the lane. Um, so it's, so it really too can be a real issue in that and in our organizations. Um, all right. <clears throat> I'm not a role model, right? We all love, I love Charles Barkley and everybody says he's like one of the nicest humans. Um, and even though I was never an Auburn guy, everybody loves Charles. He, he of course is known for this, this quote of I'm not a role model. I think the reality is that we all are right. And that we're all creating our legacy, like it or not, know it or not, that we're all creating our legacy of whether the question might be, whether it's going to be positive or negative or whether, but, but we're all role models to somebody, whether or not we realize it. And so, um, my, my, superhero um, friends. I actually called one last night going, hey, I'm, I'm, and he's like, oh, Professor X uh, was leading all the students at the X-Men facility and whatever. So he was a great mentor. So anyway, that's my superhero version of that. Um, but I think at times we have to think about not only are we role models and then um, to what extent, um, how are we doing that? So when I spoke to the Miami Dolphins a few years ago, the, the the week before I got there, they had a speaker come in and talk to them about gratitude, which is always important, right? And they've done studies that you can't be as anxious and other things if you're grateful. And that if you stop and force yourself to be grateful, that it, cloud, uh, it pushes a lot of thoughts out of your head and the reality. And so they talked about gratitude. So they had the dolphins write five thank you letters each. And so they had to go through and just write five notes. And, and so I asked them when I got there, I'm like, how'd that go? What did you, you guys think of that? And, and the guys were chuckling. They were like, we thought it was kind of dumb at first, but then we got into the flow and some of them actually asked for additional cards to write more. And I said, okay, well, let me just, let me just ask you, how many of you had a poster of Michael Jordan growing up as, as kids who were growing up in the eighties and nineties or whatever. And a lot of them had a poster of Jordan on their wall. And as I thought they might, and I said, okay, how many of you wrote a thank you to Jordan? Right. And so Charles is nodding. He knows the answer. Um, right. Anybody write a thank you to Jordan? No, right? They didn't write a thank you to Jordan. They didn't write a thank you to Don Shula for putting the Dolphins on the map. Terrible franchise before Coach Shula got there or to Dan Marino, right? They wrote, you know who they wrote them to, right? They wrote them to uncles and to moms and to dads and to the neighbor next door and the little league coach and the other people that we've never heard of, right? And so often I sit there and go, well, I'd be a role model if I was on TV every Sunday like Tony, right? If I was the guy with my name on the book big sized instead of the with size, right? One of my law school buddies wants me to change my first name to with. Um... But if I was, you know, they're like, hey, if I was the, the, you know, and I stop and I think that, right, that, well, I'm not a role model. And the reality is I'm going to run into people today that you're not going to and vice versa, right, that we're going to have a chance to interact with others. The other question I think we've got to think about when we think about role models is what is our role and who are we in our roles? We talked about this earlier in that uh, soul of a team. Just quickly, the owner role piece was the O. And I think it's important to think about our, our role and who we are and what we're going to do with it. Stacey King, right, played for the Bulls. He was a part of the first of the three-peats that the Bulls had. University of Oklahoma, 6'10", 200 and whatever, um, big guy. And so this is me meeting him a couple years ago. And right before this photo was taken, I said, by the way, I use you in, in all of my talks. And he was like, he, you know, OK, how are you using me? And I told him. And so then, then by then he was grinning and saying, totally, you can do that. Um, but here's the point is that Stacey King was a part of a Bulls team when Jordan scored 69 points against the Cavs. And so the other day I looked it up to make sure that Jordan still held that single game record for the Bulls. And in fact, he not only does hold that, but he holds nine of the top 10. 
69 points against the Cavs. And after the game, everybody wanted to go in. All the reporters wanted to go in to, to get a quote from Jordan before their deadline and write the article and et cetera, et cetera. And, and so there's such a crowd that one of the reporters finally says, well, I'm going to go down and talk. Nobody's talking to Stacey King. I'll go talk to him about this. And so he goes down to Stacey King and he says, Stacey, tell me about tonight when Jordan scored 69 points. And King says, oh, my gosh, I will never forget tonight. Tonight will always stand out for me as the night that Michael Jordan and I combined to score 70 points. <laughs> right? He had one. And so I asked King, I'm like, but you had to have had people around you. You had to have had family members, your agent, whatever, telling you you have to score more. And he said, absolutely. He said, but I tried to tell them that if I know my role to get rebounds, to play defense, to get the ball back to Mike, I'm going to stay in the league longer. Sure enough, he played 10 years, averaging five points a game. He knew his role and what his role was supposed to be, even though everybody around him was telling him, you should be a star. You should do this. You tr should try to stand out. He knew what his role was supposed to be. Here's this QR code. If you guys want it, just, it just goes through soul of a team. Um, you don't have to do it, uh, but you're welcome to. It's just a free download. Um, for y'all, but it just goes over the S for being selfless, the O for owning a role, the U for being unified, and the L for a larger purpose. Um, but there's no point in downloading it if you're willing to spend eighteen ninety nine um, <laughs> to buy the book. All right, that brings me to our last point, and this is an important one. I've, I've, I'm going to just sit on this for a minute. If we finish a couple minutes early, um, I'll let you guys head to the next thing. I don't want to. I don't want to. Um, step on the things to follow, but I will be around for any Q&A if anybody wants to come up and chat. Um, but I think so often, and, and uh, my superhero friends pointed out to me that Wonder Woman came out in 1941, um, and that really was, not, there was a lot of pushback because that's not what uh, women were supposed to be doing in 1941. Certainly, I'm sure not how they were supposed to be dressing. Um, but anyway, a lot of pushback, and the idea was that we have value however we are and whatever we're doing, that we don't have to have our value defined by anybody else or our performance or whatever it may be, and that we all intrinsically have value and we have value in whatever we do. And so I'm not always great at that, um, believe it or not. And Ron did a great job reading my, my bio. My back of the book bio is, is fantastic, and, and I don't do a great job um, taking compliments and, and doing so. I, I try to be um, deflective of that, and I'm great at being self-deprecating. But just to, just to hit again, <clears throat> if you'll indulge me for 30 seconds, I'm going to hit those points again. Because what you're going to hear is not what I'm going to hear, uh, that I played, grew up in Gainesville. I played two sports at Duke, uh, part of the last ACC title, right? The first one for 60 years. Duke had been a power in the 40s, it turns out. Um, and then first one for however long that was, 20 years, I guess. And then haven't won one since. Uh, went to Harvard Law School, cum laude from both places, got a degree from UF, won a Super Bowl. Um, on and on and on, uh, actually signed autographs at our Super Bowl party. You know the party is really lit when they're like, hey, the cap guy, he needs to sign an autograph. Um, so a lot of things. And then the first book I ever write, right, goes to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And so thing after thing, here's what my voice inside my head tells me. Well, yeah, you recruited to play baseball. Uh, the Santa Fe College uh, coach actually was friends with the Duke coach and he had seen me play. And so he got me recruited to Duke. So I played a year and then was cut. I walked on in football and played twice in four years that um, I kind of parlayed that into Harvard. And then I was cum laude because I actually never missed any classes, right? I was so terrified. So I turned everything on time. I knew I was the dumbest kid in the class. So I turned everything in on time. I was always in all the classes. So yeah, you graduated cum laude, big deal. I was in the era of great inflation. So Big deal there. You parlayed the sports. You weren't good enough to play sports, and you got into school, and then you got into school where you weren't really good enough to play sports. And then you actually got fired by the Bucks. Uh, you were unemployed for three years, and then you latched on to Tony Dungy's coattails, who was on the cover of Time magazine right before your book hit number one, and then you latched on to Tebow's coattails because you lived in Gainesville, et cetera, et cetera, right? And that voice, um, that voice sometimes... Um, is a lot louder than I would like it to be. One of the beautiful things about being a writer and being an introvert is that you don't have to talk to anybody. One of the really dangerous things about being a writer and being an introvert is you don't have to talk to anybody. And so by October of 2016, uh, as I'm continuing to write these books, um, self-help books, other things, uh, my wife uh, came to me and said, uh, you got to go. You got to, you're destroying. It's bad enough to watch you destroying yourself with your drinking. Um, but you can't destroy the rest of us any longer. And so she kicked me out of the house, me being um, a savvy law school grad. I was able to talk myself into, into just going 
down the hall to the guest room, at least for that night. And uh, through a variety of circumstances, um, was able to, uh, the next day, get, get started on AA, friends, Sister Hazel, other folks who had been through the sobriety journey um, openly were able to help me through that. And so this October, uh, you know, I've still got four months to go, so knock on wood, um, it'll be eight years. And, and so that and I should cut to the end. I usually forget to say I'm still with, it'll be 30 years for Amy and I in, in August. And so we've, we've worked over time to repair that. But the point is not that it's that I was dealing with the voice in my head that was way too loud, that I didn't have value, that I only had value if I did stuff. And I only had value if I accomplished this. And I only had value if I hung around with the right people. And I only had value if I got retweeted by the people who had big followings. And I only had value if whatever it may be, and there's a great book from a person at the University of Michigan, a professor called Chatter. And he talks about how we all have this voice in our head. And it's a really helpful voice. That it's a helpful voice that helps us achieve things and set goals and hold ourselves accountable. But then it also can be this really destructive voice that as I'm talking and I'm getting on a roll and I speak 300 words a minute, the voice in my head can hit 3,000 words a minute. And it can be really negative. And so he's got strategies for how to arrest that voice and how to stop that. And to realize that we all have value. And that as leaders, sometimes we hold ourselves and we think, okay, everybody's looking to me for all the answers and I have none of the answers. I don't know where to go next. I don't know what to do next. And Brene Brown talks about being vulnerable in the right situation and understanding when we can share things and the like. But the reality is that we're all going to have these self-doubts and we're all going to have these questions. And so I trust that you'll find better ways to deal with those than I do. This is going to sound stupid, and it is, because that's kind of how I'm wired. But I've got, I got it in Mount Dora. Where, there we go, down in the Lake Sumter area. I got this keychain, right? And I brought it with me. And the, the AV guys were like, why do you have to run back to your room? And I'm like, well, I forgot my keychain. Um, but I keep that in my pocket, and, and, it's, and it's funny. People will see that and be like, oh, my gosh, what an arrogant whatever. And, and of course, I'm embarrassed if anybody sees it. But it's just every now and then, um, every now and then, it's okay for me to see that and go, you know, I'm not all bad. I'm not all bad. And, and I am kind of a mess. But, but I, I, I can work through this, and that's not um, – I'm okay. Um, I actually gave a, a talk shortly after um, my first book, Quiet Strength, came out. And, and I was up in Vermont speaking to a group, and one of my law school buddies was there. And so I wrapped up by, by saying that Tony Dungy's life verse had been Proverbs 16.3, commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. And I said, look, it doesn't speak to timing, right? I was unemployed for three years and following this path. And, and now the you know, quiet strength came out, and it opened at number two on the New York Times bestseller list. And doggone that Marcus Luttrell and lone survivor who kept knocking us down. To, but eventually we got to number one and we, you know, 26 weeks in the top 10 and second best-selling sports autobiography ever behind only Lance Armstrong. And now that we know that Lance's book was fiction. Um, <laughs> so, so I, I went through all this and, and my buddy took me aside and he's like, that's a Great talk, amazing, wow, so powerful, and, and I watched your journey, and it was so great, and I said, well, thank you, you know, it was, it was a really good talk. And he said, uh, your whole premise is wrong. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, the fact that people came along and patted you on the back, and the fact that your book hit number one, big deal, who cares? The reality is that you were following what you were supposed to do, right? It was three years of unemployment, and the fact that that ended well, well, great. But the fact that people came along and patted you on the back and you got these accolades and you got this stuff, that's not what matters and that's not what gives you value. And he's totally right. That it's nice when it happens. He said, I'm thrilled for you. He said, but that's not, that's not the point of why you have value, that somebody came along and patted you on the back and, and you got all these things. So again, remember, go to Amazon and push those sales numbers up. But even if you don't, I have value, right? And the reality is that I have value because of who I am and how I'm wired and how I build into other people. And so we need to, I think we need to remember that because a lot of times the world tells us everything to the contrary, of that we have value because and we have value if. But we have value because we have value. So, this is me on social media. You're welcome to reach out to me through any of those things, through my website. Um, I, I'm happy to engage with any and all of you. I'm just up the road in Gainesville. Um, where I have after stints in Jacksonville and Tampa and Jacksonville and elsewhere back in Gainesville, maybe for good. Um, but anyway, I really appreciate your time, and, uh, and I'll be around if, if anybody's got any questions. Actually, let me hold. We've got 10 minutes. Let me finish with this, and then I'll, so you'll still have seven minutes to go. Let me finish with this final story, um, because I think this just ties into, again, value, creating value, being a role model, having an impact. 
And this will be my final point that I'll leave you with. Shortly after Quiet Strength came out, um, the book had, had hit. Uh, we, had, we had written it. We wrote it in a month. The goal was if we wrote it fast after Tony won the Super Bowl, he didn't want to write a book, thought nobody would listen to him, thought he didn't have anything to share, and I would spent three years trying to tell him to the contrary. And So I do feel somewhat vindicated by this. So anyway, so I bird-dogged him to write this book. So we write it in a month. It comes out in July. Tony promoted it for a week, and then he went off to training camp. So then he's in the middle of the season, so he gets a call, and, and this may surprise you, but um, football fans are willing to voice their opinions. Uh, what they're not willing to do, apparently, is read. Go figure. Um, so they'd always warned us the book may not sell because football fans don't seem to read. Um, but, but they will give you their opinion on talk radio or whatever. And we would get letters. I'd, I'd open letters at the Bucks, and people would draw play diagrams, and they'd go, hey, this works on my son's high school team. You're never getting your tight end open, but this play will be great or why are you not playing so-and-so more or whatever. And so Tony gets a call one day, and so his assistant always screened them, of course, but this one day she said, Tony, I think you need to call this guy back. So Tony calls the man back, and the man says, my son was engaged to be married. His fiance passed away. And my son is devastated, understandably, and I'm watching him in this downward spiral. We've got counseling for him. He's meeting with somebody. But uh, just as, as one father to another, would you be willing to reach out to my son? And for those of you who don't know the backstory, Tony had a son who took his own life shortly before we wrote the book. And, and, and that was part of what it prompted Tony to write it. To, he didn't want to necessarily be open about it and whatever and, and reopen all those wounds. But he wanted to be open to an extent and talk about it and see if he could help folks. And so this father reached out to him. And Tony said, I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to call him. So Tony called and, and he spoke to the young man. And, and they talked about things, and they talked a few days later, and then they talked a few days after that, and a few days after that. And Tony just continued to tell him, hey, this is not always going to feel this way. And, and that I, you know, life is going to be hard, and this is going to be tough, but, but you know, just continue to push ahead. And, and whatever it was, and they just shared and talked. And, and so finally, they're on the phone one time, and, and the young man says, um, the wedding date passed last weekend. And between you and counseling and my family and the like, for the first time, I've seen the sun peek through the clouds, and I finally see a little bit of hope. And, and I just wanted to thank you for all the time you've spent on the phone with me. And Tony said, I've been happy to do it, and it's been my pleasure, my honor. And the young man said, well, I keep forgetting to ask you, um, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do? And Tony said, I'm a football coach. And the young man said, that's, that's really cool. High school or college? <laughs> And so the reality was, right, that he had the defending Super Bowl champion coach on the, on the phone who was on TV every weekend. And that the rest of us would have been floored to go, I can't believe I'm on the phone with Tony. And for this kid, it was somebody picking up the phone and saying, you have value, you matter. And the reality was that we all can do that, right? That we all can do that, that we have value and that we all can help others see that value. So with that, I will thank you for your time and have a great day.